I've found that reading past order reports is the best way to improve as a pen tester or a bug bounty hunter, whether that's on the job doing peer reviews or reading publicly available reports in the bug bounty space. You get to pick up a lot of tricks while you're reading these reports that you wouldn't have otherwise and sometimes they point you in the right directions where you can do further research on a particular topic and improve your skills. And it's really no different when it comes to learning smart contract auditing and competing in these audit contests on Code Arena. There are over a hundred reports here to read through and review past audit findings, learn the patterns, and in turn, you'll be able to recognize these patterns during your own audit. Um, in this video, I'm going to share some of my experience reading through these audit reports. Uh, also, I'll be talking through all the findings in the most recent audit report for Sturdy. I think this is a pretty good one to start off with because the findings have quite a lot of overlap with previous uh, audit findings and they don't seem to be that difficult on this report as in the findings are not that technically difficult to understand and digest. I'll explain all the high and medium severity findings in this report and share the patterns I've noticed in these findings, I provide links to other reports where same or similar findings were reported uh, in the past, so you can uh, start to compare and contrast these findings. So hopefully this video will be useful in showcasing how to start understanding and absorbing some of the valuable information that is contained in these past order reports. Uh, there is literal gold in these reports, and this is probably the best part of a code arena all the reports are public and the community is friendly and helpful towards beginners looking to learn and make progress here now just a note before we jump in and start talking about some findings some prerequisites that you might need before you start reading these order reports are solidity basics a DeFi basics and traditional finance basics i covered a lot of these topics in my previous video um, the roadmap for beginners, how to get into smart contract auditing. So check that video out if you need some learning resources on these three. But you don't need to be an expert in any of these three to start looking at audit reports. And that's kind of like a point that I do want to stress. If there's anything that you don't understand in these reports, it's probably that you are lacking in one of these three areas. Once you realize which area that you're lacking, you can then go and research on those topics with the goal of understanding that particular finding. So that is a really good way to learn everything in context, right? So you are researching what you need to understand these reports and you're going to apply that knowledge when you are trying to understand the finding. And I'll just also mention that you definitely don't need to understand everything in these reports to get value out of them. Uh, definitely do stick to reports that are at your level of understanding or you're just going to get burnt out and think that you're never going to be able to understand any of this. So just as a funny example, when I first got onto Code Arena, I think this was one of the first reports that I reviewed, Elasticswap. And I went to the high severity finding, the first one on this report. I was looking through this finding and oh my god, I could literally feel the imposter syndrome crushing my soul. Like, what the hell is this? Like, I couldn't understand any of this. Something like this was way over my head at the time. And if you have this general feeling when you're reading through a particular finding, it's okay to skip it and come back to it later. There are a lot more lower hanging fruit than this and during audits and you don't need to find all the bugs to be successful when hunting on Code Arena. So stick to something more to your level. Uh, when I actually started reading these past order reports, I actually started reading from the bottom up. So I went from understanding the gas optimization issues and then the non-criticals and the low severity findings. I tried to understand pretty much all of them first and then I started working on the mediums and highs. So start from the bottom if you really cannot understand some of the mediums and highs. And these lows and non-criticals, they're pretty much all self-explanatory. 
So the solution is don't burn yourself out trying to do too much too quickly. Start from the low risk findings, go back to the learning materials, and then once you've done a bit, you've passively sort of absorbed more information during your research, your reading through these findings, then you can go back and it makes things much easier when you return to these uh, mediums and highs later on. Okay, so let's jump in and start reading this sturdy report. So this first high severity finding is around slippages. So slippage is a traditional finance concept where there may be a difference between the expected price of a trade and the price that the trade is actually executed at. It pretty much occurs every time you make a trade in the market, but it is most prevalent during high volatility or if the liquidity isn't very high in that particular market. Whenever you see slippage that is hard coded, that is going to be a problem because you're not going to be able to adjust for slippage during changing market conditions. So for example, if a coin tanked very quickly, such as what happened to UST recently, user funds will be locked if the slippage is too tightly controlled. So in this case, the slippage is hard coded to 99%, meaning that the swap will not go through if you lose more than 1% of funds due to slippage. And during times of high market volatility, you're not going to be able to stay within that 1% range. So that's going to be causing a denial of service condition where user funds will be locked. So generally what you want to do is allow the user to specify the amount of slippage that they are willing to tolerate and have that as a parameter that the user can control themselves. And that way the user can adjust their slippage depending on the particular market condition and their own risk tolerance. Issues around slippage is actually fairly common in Code Arena contests. In fact, there are 19 instances where this has happened in previous order reports. I've made a list here and I'll share all the links to these reports in the video description below. These are the payout that the warden received for finding this issue and how many wardens found that particular issue. I do recommend you to read through these other instances of slippage issues in past order reports and just compare and contrast them to this particular finding in the sturdy audit. So in summary, there were 19 instances of slippage check issues. In total, 64 wardens found these issues and the reward was 42k amongst all of these instances. So in summary, slippage can be an issue if it's hard coded either to a value that's too strict such as 99% or a value that is too lax such as 0% where then you can be front run and lose money during the swap. And actually this does relate to a medium severity finding further down below which I'll mention when we get there. The second high severity issue in this report is checking for transfer success after the return statement. There's nothing too interesting to talk about in this particular finding. I did cover it also in a previous video. Basically, they are checking this transfer, whether it's succeeded or not, after the return statement, which is just a bug in the code. So pretty easy bug to spot and fairly self-explanatory. Now onto the mediums, this one is possible lost message.value. This is a finding around validating message.value, whether that's zero or equal to a particular amount that you require. In this case, the deposit function is handling both ETH and also ERC20 tokens in the same function. Whenever you do this, it's important to make sure that when you're transferring ERC20 tokens, the user doesn't actually send message.value during that particular transaction. Because if they do, the value that they sent will be essentially lost because this code block doesn't handle the message.value that is transferred in during that function call. So in short, validating message.value is a way to protect users from accidentally sending ETH when they don't intend to and it'll revert the transaction if they accidentally do something that's not expected. In this codebase, the address 0 represents ETH 
So the validation that we want to do here is check that the message.value is zero when we're transferring in ERC20 tokens, and then check the message.value is equal to the proper amount when we're trying to transfer ETH. The issue of validating message.value occurred five times in previous order contests. Again, I'll put links to these reports and the particular findings down below so you can go ahead and review these and compare and contrast these findings. In summary, the total award that has been paid for message.value validation issues in the past is 12k. On average, awarded and received 348 per finding. The next medium severity issue is the swap fee is hard coded for Uniswap v3. Now this issue here was found by two different wardens and whenever this happens you get the option of reviewing the finding from both wardens. I think in this case the other warden actually submitted a clearer explanation to this issue. So to view the submissions from other wardens you can click this and open up in a new tab and this will actually bring you to the findings repo where all the findings that has been submitted for this audit contest is published. So scroll down and you can hover over these links and see these other submissions that were duplicates and click onto them to see the other submissions from other wardens. I think this particular submission was much better explained than the one that was published in this report. So I'll go over this finding using this submission instead. So the gist of this issue here is that it's using a hard-coded pool to perform all the transfers. Namely, it's using the 1% fee pool regardless of the asset being transferred. Using a fixed pool to perform a swap is too restrictive and it may force the user to use a pool that is not optimal so they have to pay more fees, receive a worse price, etc. So for example, in Uniswap v3, there is the 1% pool and also the 0.05% pool. So you can see here that the 1% pool for USDC to ETH here has 27 million in liquidity at the moment and you have to pay a 1% fee to use this pool. And in contrast, the 0.05% fee pool has 225 million in liquidity. So using the non-optimal pool in this case will have the user lose more money due to slippage and also pay a higher fee. The mitigation around this is having a customizable configuration so that pools with the best liquidity can be used. So just providing the user a bit more flexibility in choosing the best pool to use so they can get the best price for their particular swap. Quite similar to the slippage issue we mentioned earlier, just providing the user a bit more flexibility around that to adjust to the market conditions. This issue of not having a customizable swap path has been identified three times in past audit contests. The third one was actually a code base that was trying to implement that custom swap path, but there was a bug in the code that was trying to implement it. The average reward for the swap path issue is 1.8k, which is pretty high for a bug that isn't that hard to spot if you know this pattern and you are looking for it. The third medium severity issue is an issue around unbounded loops. Whenever you are looping through an array and that array could be unbounded potentially, there is an issue that you may run out of gas during the transaction and it'll result in a DOS condition for the whole function call. So here we can see in the process yield function, there is a for loop that is looping through the whole of extra rewards. And this particular array is unbounded because you can see in this function below, the reward manager can call this however many times they want and push more items onto this extra rewards array. Since there's no limit on how large this array can get, if it gets large enough to make it run out of gas in the transaction, then it'll cause a DOS condition where the rewards can never be processed. And an attacker can cause a denial of service condition by sprinkling dust into this extra rewards array. Issues around unbounded loop has occurred 10 times during past audit contests. 
In summary, the average reward has been $553. And do check out these other links for these other reports in the video description below. So the next medium severity issue kind of relates back to the previous one because since process yield is doing everything in an unbounded loop, if a particular transfer for an ERC token fails, then the whole function will fail and it will cause a denial of service condition. This finding is pointing out the fact that some ERC20 tokens do not allow zero transfers. So zero transfers will fail and that will essentially fail the whole function call of a process yields. So the recommended mitigation step is to add a validation here to make sure that the yield amount is greater than zero and only then add this particular yield amount to that transfer loop. For such a small validation issue, I was surprised that this only occurred four times in previous order contests and it was only found by one warden each time and the payout was massive for this particular issue in past instances. Now I say there were four wardens who found this issue, it was actually just a single guy who submitted the four findings in previous instances. So he pretty much got the whole of the 14k for this particular issue in previous order contests. The fifth medium severity issue is a bug around calling the decimals function on address 0. If you recall in a previous finding that uh, we mentioned that in this code base, the protocol makes it that if the asset is set to address 0, then actually that means it's transferring ETH. So in this case, it wrongly calls the decimals function on the asset parameter, which could be address zero in the case that it's ETH. So this function will fail and revert the transaction. So just a small oversight in the code and a fairly easy fix to put a validation in place. And for the final medium severity issue, this is actually written up in a pretty complicated way referencing MEV and front running and all that. But the gist of it, it's actually just a slippage issue. If we like before review the findings from other wardens, and you can see here that this issue is pretty similar to the first high severity. Here we can see the slippage is set here and it's a public constant set to 5%. So this really shows the benefit when several wardens found a particular issue. Just in case that this finding in the final report is written up too complicated or you don't really understand it for some reason. So that covers all the highs and mediums in this particular report. I won't go over the low to non-critical issues in this report because most of it you can pretty much just uh, understand with a couple of Google searches and it's mostly self-explanatory. So I hope that was a good explanation of this particular report. If you found this useful, let me know in the comments below and I might do more of these later down the road as I review more of these reports. 